All right, so the PlayStation conference has concluded and we finally got an idea of what we are going to be paying for the PlayStation consoles in the next generation at launch. Microsoft has already revealed, kind of unwillingly I think, what the Xbox Series something is going to end up costing when that gets released as well. So now that we see what both consoles are going to be costing us, we can get a better idea on what kind of things we're going to be looking forward to in this generation, which console is going to have the advantages in certain ways. And the tech specs, although a little bit of light on the details in my opinion, they for the most part have been revealed so we can kind of get an idea of what we are going to be seeing out of them, at least in terms of like the technical quality of the games. So let's take a quick look at this. Now this is uh, the Engadget website. So we have, well, all this information isn't really all that important to me, but both Sony and Microsoft have gone and priced their consoles rather aggressively. The PS5 disc version and the Xbox Series X are both launching at $499, which is a pretty good price considering what you're going to be getting out of it. I expected maybe $500 was the minimum price that I was expecting to see these kinds of things at. I thought it's possible that they could launch at 6 but that would probably have been a mistake. People wouldn't have wanted to pay $600 for them even though they're willing to spend that much money on a cell phone, say, cell phone that they carry for a year or even more. People pay like $1,100 for a freaking cell phone that they do nothing special with it. But anyway, $500 is probably the maximum price, and it seems to be that Sony and Microsoft both know this. So they launching they are launching their consoles at that price range. Now, I think is what a little bit more interesting, though, is what the cheaper versions of the consoles are going to end up costing. Microsoft fired a shot across the bow with the Xbox Series S, pricing it at $299, although I do believe this is a bit of an underpowered console. That $299 price is actually a pretty good aggressive price deal there. It gets you into the next generation, even though the console itself is a little underpowered, it does have, it is a nice price point to get somebody in the door. It's going to play all of the Series X games, just worse in some way. But the $299 price is a good price. Someone can look at that and go, you know what? I don't have a whole crap ton of money, but I do have uh, $299 is not going to break my bank. So let me spend that. Sony, I think, has gone and done something that I didn't think that they would do and release the digital version, that's the discless version of the PlayStation 5 at $399. It's listed at $400 here, but it's $399. The $400 makes it $100 less than the disc version of the PlayStation 5, which is a little surprising to me because the only difference, as far as I can tell, between those two versions of the PlayStation 5 console is the fact that one has a, a Blu-ray disc drive and one doesn't. Now, if you got to think that, okay, so the Blu-ray less version is going to be cheaper to manufacture, but it's not $100 cheaper to manufacture. In fact, I'd be surprised if it cost Sony $10 to... They save $10 on the digital version as opposed to the disc version. So, okay, so this one is cheaper to manufacture, but not by a whole lot. So I was expecting, say, the standard PS5 to launch at $499 and the discless version, the digital version, to be at $449. But, you know, they undercut my expectations and released it at $400, which is a an aggressive price... I think maybe that they were going to launch at $499 and $449, but then they saw Microsoft announced Series S at $299 and say, you know what, they're going to eat our lunch. People aren't going to be particularly happy with the Series S, I think, but they will definitely buy it because it's it would end up being $150 less than the $449 price point. So they sliced off sliced off that $100 off the disc version to make a nice... 399 console. 
Now, it is still $100 more than the Series S, but given the performance differential between them, I think it's $100 well spent. We're not really going to know how this is going to shake out, though, until we start seeing games hit the wild and you start seeing, like, say, Digital Foundry go and produce these videos that show the differences between the Series S and the Series X or the PlayStation 5 to really tell what kind of a difference it's going to end up being. But I think it's not going to be that insignificant. Not that the Series S is going to have crap games, but there may be some difficulties. So let's roll down a little bit to specifications. CPU. Now we have in this a AMD Zen 2 8-core processor. Now there are some differences in clock frequency between the PlayStation and the Xbox variants. So you have in both versions of the PS5, you have a 8-core processor clocked at 3.5 gigahertz. Now AMD processors are not the end-all be-all best thing for gaming. Intel still holds that crown, but They've improved quite a bit when they released the Zen and the Ryzen line of processors a couple of years ago, and the Zen 2 was an improvement over that, closing that gap with Intel a fair bit. So, I am happy with what I'm seeing here with these processors here. Clocked at 3.5 gigahertz. Let's compare that to what we got with the, say, the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, which was a... Well, what the hell was that core called? wasn't Bulldozer, it was uh, Jaguar. The Jaguar cores ran at like 3 point, or rather 1.7 or 1.8 gigahertz. The Zen 2 is significantly more performance and um, efficient when it comes to, like you got more instructions per clock cycle. It's also running at 3.5 gigahertz, which is more than twice the speed. So even though it doesn't seem like an enormous difference, there's still eight core processors from the last generation to the current generation, or the next generation rather, but they are significantly more powerful. Now we do see a difference between what Sony has here and what Microsoft has. Microsoft has actually clocked up their processor a little bit. It's probably an identical core design. The, they're both using the Zen 2, and it says custom, uh, custom, let's put that in air quotes here. Aimed, uh, Microsoft's console has a 3.8 gigahertz clock frequency, and it drops down to 3.6 if you enable simultaneous multitasking. The simultaneous multitasking is sort of, I, I forget what AMD calls their version of this technology, but Intel calls it uh, hyper-threading, which is having your processor uh, co individual core operating as though it is a two-core device. So that eight-core with simultaneous multitasking is able to process 16 threads simultaneously. Now there is a performance hit, a performance penalty while doing that kind of thing, but depending on the application that you're running on, it may be a worthy trade-off. In fact, I think in most cases it is, except for possibly gaming, where I think developers are still having a hard time utilizing 8 threads and asking like, oh, now you have 16. Mm, most aren't really up to the task. Now there is a 200 megahertz difference between when simultaneous multi-threading is enabled or not. But even with it enabled, it is still 100 megahertz faster than what uh, Sony is rocking in the PS5. Now when you look over at the Series S, you actually drop a couple hundred megahertz off the base frequency. 3.6 gigahertz, which drops to 3.4 when SMT is enabled. SMT being enabled in the Xbox console has been confirmed by Microsoft as being something that the user code, the games, are able to determine. And Sony hasn't said whether that's something that the PlayStation 5 can do or not. I, it, it may be something that they can do, just Sony hasn't mentioned it because they don't feel like it's something that's important. But Sony never said anything, so we're just going to assume for the time being that it can't. Now it clocks down to 3.4 with simultaneous multitasking enabled. I think a lot of developers are just going to keep it disabled because they don't want to have to spread their process across all those different threads. Now I think the... 300 megahertz advantage that Microsoft has 
or 1 to 300 megahertz advantage Microsoft has with their console is not nothing. It is not, it, it's hard to call it significant, but it is not negligible. It may result in something along the lines of a PlayStation game which is CPU limited and an Xbox game which is like a port, like let's say the next Call of Duty, may be CPU limited. So the PlayStation may run up to a thing where it's trying to keep 60 frames per second, but the CPU might be a little bit overloaded, so it might drop down to like 58 frames per second or something like that. I'm a little bit unstable with its frame rate. Microsoft would be in a little bit of a better position to maintain a solid frame rate because all the core logic going on in the background is able to be processed just a little bit faster. It may not make a big difference, and you probably won't see anything significant in terms of an advantage when it comes to exclusives or first-party games, but third-party games you might see a little bit of a difference there. The Zen 2 8-core 3.6 gigahertz in the Series S, though, might pose a little bit of a problem. I think Microsoft is making a mistake here by lowering the performance even a little bit on the Series S. It's fine to do this kind of thing with the GPU because it's easier to scale the workload of a graphics processor than it is on a CPU. The core logic going on behind the scenes of a game, regardless of the graphical fidelity, is probably going to be almost identical because you're dealing with things like artificial intelligence or network communication or all that kind of stuff, which it doesn't matter what the game ends up looking like, all of that stuff needs to be handled by the CPU, and it's going to have to be handled by the CPU regardless of whether you turn the graphic settings up or down. So by cre creating a version of the machine which operates 200 megahertz slower, you could potentially be either creating a headache for the developer, which is going to be hard to overcome because like they may clock the uh, this game so that it runs at 60 frames per second on the series X but when trying to make the series S version of it which it's going to be the same version but it runs on both machines they might have a hard time because like okay it's 60 frames per second then you run into the same problem with the port with the PlayStation 5 it runs slower on the Series S, and that may that 3.6 gigahertz might just not be enough to maintain like a stable frame rate. I think developers are going to put a lot of effort into making sure that that isn't obvious to the end user, the gamer. But I think it's going to cause some headaches with development. All right, so moving on. So we have a custom RDNA 2. It's an AMD graphics processor being used in the next generation of uh, graphics cards from AMD. Now, we do have some disparities here in terms of performance between Xbox and PlayStation 5. Sony has 10.28 teraflops uh, processor, which is 36 compute units running at 2.23 gigahertz. And, of course, this is identical between the two versions of the Sony console. Microsoft, on the other hand, has gone balls to the frickin' wall with performance on this and has clocked their machine at only 1.825 gigahertz, but with a higher number of compute units, probably making the processor a tad more expensive to manufacture. But this results in a performance of 12.15 uh, giga teraflops. Now, that is not an insignificant increase in terms of performance. It is not world-changing, but it is not an insignificant thing. In fact, it's probably... Uh, it's a little bit less than the comparative performance advantage that the PS4 had ahead of the Xbox One. And in that generation, we saw, like, okay, so Xbox One launched the game at 720p, and the PlayStation 4 would do it at 1080p. So, in exclusive games, it's the kind of thing that you won't see a performance difference on. Like, um, something being made exclusively for the Xbox Series, whatever, or the PlayStation 5 will find a way to make it work and they will look awesome. But, ports between the two, you're probably going to see Microsoft pull ahead in terms of either resolution or frame rate. 
also the fact that Sony uses less compute units but clocks at a higher clock frequency. Mark Cerny, the, the lead architect of the PS4 and the PS5, and I think the Vita as well, had said some really odd things. He had, he had said that it's easier to program for a smaller number of compute units running at a higher clock frequency than it is a larger number of compute units running at a lower clock frequency. Now, that's true, but it is not an enormous difference because uh, graphics rendering is something which is oftentimes referred to as, uh, what is it called, uh, absurdly parallel or something like that. It's very easy to parallelize the throughput or the graphics rendering in a GPU. So between 36 and 52 compute units, yeah, sure, it is probably easier to program for the 36 than it is for the 52 because you have fewer separate processors that you have to spread the performance across. And there is a slight performance penalty when it comes to splitting that up across more uh, more compute units and fewer. But I still feel like Microsoft has the advantage here. Also, that uh, 2.23 gigahertz is going to run hotter, which is probably the reason why the machine is so gigantic. The PS5 uh, is huge. Although there are the extra hardware for the 52 compute units will also generate more heat. The fact that it runs at a fairly significantly lower clock frequency probably negates that. The Series S, though, is where we run into some strange things to think about. It's a 20 compute unit machine running at 1.565 gigahertz, performing at uh, 4 teraflops. Now that is a significant downgrade. It's little less than a third of what you're going to be seeing on its companion um, hardware, the Series X. And you know what, you can go with reduced performance and graphics hardware fairly easily and have hard and have games which run just fine across both machines. You just have to be willing to make compromises. Now the easiest compromise is going to be to scale down the resolution or um, throttle back on frame rate. Now people aren't going to really tolerate much of the frame rate throttling. People are getting especially geared to be able to recognize when something isn't maintaining a stable frame rate in this current generation. So say the Series X launches a game at 60 frames per second and the Series S only does it at 30, people are going to notice and there will be some rage about that. So the easiest thing to do is lower the game resolution. They can put a dynamic resolution scaling in a game and it fairly easily and it reduces the image resolution which lowers the lowers the um, workload on the GPU uh, uh, proportionally to the lowering of the resolution because when we're dealing with say shader programs you're going to have like every pixel has to be computed by a shader processor, by uh, one of these compute units. And the fewer pixels, uh, the easier it is on the GPU. But 40 teraflops, or 40 teraflops, 4 teraflops, 40, is a pretty significant downgrade. Now, I feel like maybe this was just Microsoft trying to uh, burn off their lower bend um, Zen processors that came off the assembly line. So it doesn't quite work as well. Well, disable half the hardware or two-thirds of the hardware and just release it as a Series S processor. It's also clocked slower. It's clocked even slower than the Series X. So this machine is going to have a much lower uh, power draw from the electrical outlet. It's also significantly less, uh, going to generate a lot less heat but it's making a lot of compromises in terms of performance. Now you may still, it's, what was, what was the PS4 Pro? It was four teraflops also, I think, right? It's probably, like, it's going to be more powerful than the PS4 Pro just because the CPU is better. And our DNA 2 is a more efficient piece of hardware than whatever the hell was being used on the Pro. But it doesn't feel like the next generation leap. That $299 price difference, uh, that price point of the Series S, is really going to be the selling point with this machine. 
Now we're getting the RAM. 16 gigabytes of GDDR6 at 256-bit. I guess it's the um, the interface bus. It's identical across the two PlayStation systems, of course. Now, the Series S, the, rather the Series X, who use a 320-bit GDDR6. With not much detail there. Which I think this is maybe a little bit of a... They're saying it's 320-bit. I don't think it's 320-bit across the whole 16 gigabytes. But it's uh, something in there is 320 bits. The Series S only has 10. Now, I think this is maybe their second big mistake that they're making with the Series S. Lowering the memory of a system is also something that is going to cause a lot of headaches for developers. So you have the PlayStation 5 and you have the Series X. You have, say, a port between the, or a cross-platform game between them. You have the same amount of memory. I don't know how much the operating system is going to use, but you have the same amount of memory. So if your memory footprint of a game is, let's say there's 15 gigabytes available through all of that to the developer. 15 is probably too much. Let's say 12. 12 gigabytes available to the game developers for user code. And you're going to fill that memory up between textures and game logic and all that kind of stuff. That 16 gigabytes is going to get used. But then you also have to release a version of it which will run on the Series S. And it has to fit into this 10 gigabyte footprint. Now, you're going to slice off the operating system's chunk. So following the same numbers, it's going to end up being 6 gigabytes remaining. Hey, you told me that I had 12. Now I only have 6 that I have to use it on this Series S. Well, that's a lot less work that I can do. Now, there are some efficiencies that you can put into this. You don't need as high a resolution texture, so you can save a little bit of memory there. Your frame buffer is not going to be as large. A 4K frame buffer is four times the size of a 1080 frame buffer. And it's half the size of a 1440 frame buffer that Microsoft is saying a Series X is going to be capable of, but honestly a frame buffer is not an enormous amount of memory in modern contexts. So it's certainly not 6 gigabytes in size. So there's a lot of sacrifices that are being made in this in terms of the size of the memory pool in the system. I am wondering if this is going to end up for these uh, first party Microsoft games, which or any Microsoft game for the Xbox One X, is going to have to, they're going to be the developers sitting there and going like, oh, okay, here's the Series X, we have all of this awesome hardware in here, but we have to make sure that this game fits in the memory footprint of a 10 gigabyte console first. And then, once we get it working there, then we can start putting in some things like the larger frame buffer or the larger textures or anything like that. It could limit the sort of graphical performance of the Series X. Okay, so moving on. Memory bandwidth is another interesting thing. Now, of course, it's uh, identical between the PlayStation machines at 448 gigabytes per second. And that's a reasonable performance of memory for this generation, I think. Microsoft has gotten weird with this one. Their memory architecture is split, which is why I said I don't think all of the memory is 320 bits uh, interface with um, the Series X. 10 gigabytes runs at this blazing fast 560 gigabytes per second. But the following 6 gigabytes runs at a lower um, lower speed of 336 gigabytes per second. And that is probably because, I think anyway, because uh, the memory interface bus, a majority of it is being used for that first 10 gigabytes and then using what little interface they had left, let's say, let's say, uh, okay, memory interface is 64 gigabytes wide, or 64 bits wide. You didn't have as many um, memory interface bits to spend on that final 6 gigabytes, so put it in at a reduced uh, bandwidth at 336. Kind of a weird split there. 
So I don't know if that six gigabytes is going to be used up by the op mostly by the operating system or by like say multimedia or whatever that doesn't require as much bandwidth. But if it's left in the hands of the developers to decide, like okay, I'm going to be throwing these high speed tasks at the high speed memory and then I got some things that aren't as memory intensive I'm gonna throw that at the low speed memory it's a little bit of an extra complication thrown on the developers if I were doing this I would have preferred to have just one pool of memory that all runs at the same speed but if developers are capable of sitting there and really working at it and optimizing the code they can really get a lot of, out of this kind of architecture here. So in the long run this might actually work out for Microsoft developers being able to throw higher speed stuff at this and lower speed stuff at this and get better performance out of it overall but at, in the early days I think developers are going to struggle with it. Microsoft of course on the Series S made compromises and they're pretty significant here. You have 8 gigabytes of RAM at 224 gigabytes per second which is less than half the speed of the Series X and it's also another split architecture with 2 gigabytes running at 56 gigabytes per second. Now of course when we're not dealing with I think the biggest thing that we have to worry about memory performance in a lot of these cases is going to be that frame buffer. Now the frame buffer of course like I said before is not an enormous amount of memory um, but let, let's let's um, hold on Okay, I did some quick and probably shoddy math to see that a, a 4K frame buffer and with a 32-bit uh, color depth is going to end up using like 33, gig, uh, 33 megabytes worth of memory. Now, 33 megabytes, okay, I may have done that math wrong. <laughs> I feel like I did that math wrong, but I'm not going to go back and check. It's not an enormous amount of memory, but when we're dealing with, say, like render targets or anything like that which is going to or say double buffering where you're going to have multiple frame uh, stored in there and builds up that amount of memory used but that frame buffer of 33 mega megabytes is going to be used rather extensively because it has to be updated for 60 frames per second game has to be updated 60 times per second so the frame buffer is going to be where a majority where the memory high-speed memory bandwidth is really going to come in handy and the series s simply doesn't have that now it's obviously not designed to run 4k games so the load on the frame frame buffer is going to be less so it doesn't need as high-speed memory but you're still going to run into performance problems say even on the cpu side because the cpu does need to use memory it's not just the gpu so your CPU is also running slower, a little bit slower, but still slower. And it's interfacing with memory that runs a lot slower. That could run into a problem. And also, I don't know if this problem was fixed with the Zen 2, but the original Zen processors released a couple of years ago had an issue where instead of being a like a true-to-life 8-core processor, it was actually two 4-core processors that were linked together. Now, if core... Um, quad one needed to oper uh, and communicate with core quad two they needed to interface with each other across the memory controller hardware device located on the processing package the memory uh, the memory controller is going to operate at the clock speed of the ram so it's possible that if this is the result of a lower speed memory you could have a reduction in performance of the CPU just by having slower access to the memory as well as slower access across the memory controller between the two processing quads. Now I don't know if the Zen 2 architecture alleviated that. It might be a true 8 core processor to one 8 core uh, setup instead of two quad core setups in the same package. It might also not be that much of a problem because the RAM clock frequency which we don't see any information of on either the PlayStation 5 or the Xbox one might actually be identical between the, the Series S and the Series X but the higher performance of the X might be on account of this larger 320 bit memory um, bus and this Series S which they didn't say what it is might be significantly less I'm not going to do the math but let's say it's 
let's say it's like 224 bits or some crap like that. I, I'm, that number is definitely wrong, but I'm going to stick with it because I'm arrogant as fuck. So the reduced memory address bus might be responsible for the lower performance, and that would keep the clock frequency the same, so alleviate that problem. I don't know. It's all speculation. Internal storage. Sony has an 825 gigabyte solid state drive using a custom interface with uh, the PlayStation 5. We have a one terabyte PCIe Generation 4, PCIe 4, um, NVMe SSD for the Series X, and a 512 gigabyte um, NVMe SSD on the Series S. That is a fairly this one's a little bit more straightforward between the Series S and the Series X because it's less memory. It's less storage space in the machine. Now, this is expandable through memory cards, which are little NVMe things plugged into a memory card kind of thing, stuck in a memory card. Which you're gonna, I forget who's selling it, but it's all licensed by Microsoft. I'm a little bit worried on how much money that's going to end up costing because this kind of thing never ends up being good for the, cons the consumer. PlayStation Vita memory cards were unique to Sony machines and they ended up costing a lot of money. The hard disks, hard drives for the Xbox 360 had to be bought from Microsoft and they were expensive. So I don't know how much it's going to end up costing. Sony using this 825 gigabyte SSD, I honestly, through the architecture of the system, I don't think they could have made a larger solid state drive at the moment, not until the density of the memory chips got higher. I think this was actually due to the interface and all that kind of stuff, the, the largest that they could have made, which is why we're not seeing like a one terabyte version or a more expensive two terabyte version or anything like that. But there is a kind of a custom interface for that with a lot of like background things that makes performance a little bit more efficient, which moves on to IO throughput. Sony has a rather significant advantage in this category. The, of course, the PlayStation is identical between the two systems, and for the first time, so is the two versions of the Xbox. 5.5 gigabytes per second raw through their custom compression Sony has 8 to 9 gigabytes and Microsoft has 2.4 gigabytes raw or through their compression system 4.8 gigabytes per second that is an enormous advantage on Sony's part there now it's going to remain to be seen what this is going to end up meaning for actual games I think when it comes to third party games that are being released um for both systems, those cross-platform games, it's not going to be enormous. You're probably going to see Sony's machine load a little bit faster. Even though the, the throughput is twice as much, it's not going to result in twice or half the loading times. I think when you start seeing the advantages will really just be when it comes to exclusive games that are released for that specific hardware. The um, Mark Cerny had mentioned this a lot during the unveil of the PlayStation 3, how there's a, it loads so fast that you could potentially have like the textures of the environment objects or something like that simply not be loaded into system memory when you're not looking at them. And as you spin your camera around or your character around, it loads so fast that it can bring it into memory that quick. Now, I don't know if that's really a practical thing. I'd be a little bit worried about, say, a hang in the system or something like that where it doesn't come through fast enough. But it does mean that you will be able to not use memory in the same way that we used to have to. So, okay, so we have a hard disk in the PlayStation 3, the Xbox 360, the PS4, and the Xbox One. Much faster than the optical drives we used to have to use. But they were still pretty slow in comparison to the memory performance and the games that we're trying to run and all that. So you would use a lot of memory, the 8 gigabytes of system memory that were in the previous generation, to store objects and all that kind of stuff that were not needing to be used immediately, but would, need, would probably need to be used in the short term. Say, 
you're walking into an area where, like, okay, so the hallway. You're in a hallway. The rooms that are adjacent to the hallway have special textures in them and all that kind of stuff. You're going to need to load them as you walk into the area because when you hit that door to open it, you're not going to be able to load those textures fast enough off the hard disk to write them in the memory in the areas that need to be in order to texture that room once you can see it. Now that's no longer the case. These machines can load their data so fast, and if a game is designed to be able to load memory that fast, it's going to be able to, it's like, okay, when you're standing outside the door, instead of just in the hallway, we can load the textures up there. And they will be available once the door opens. Now, Microsoft and Sony's consoles are going to both be capable of doing this kind of thing, but it's clearly going to be significantly easier on the PlayStation machine because it can run things quite a bit faster. Of course, how that's going to end up working, we haven't really seen much for. I think the Ratchet and Clank game, I forget what the subtitle is for that, the Ratchet and Clank game is really the only thing that we've seen take advantage of that kind of advantage, where you have those rifts that open up and then you jump through them and the next area you're in loads up so quick it's pretty much seamless. I think that is the one example we've seen so far of that being a big uh, big deal. But the fact also it's worthy of noting that the speeds of these machines are so much faster that we don't have to pre-cache textures or sound effects or any of that kind of stuff nearly to the same level we used to have to. The demands on memory are going to be significantly less. So I heard people grumbling that 16 gigabytes wasn't enough for the current generation because we had 8 gigabytes in the previous generation. People wanted to see a four times increase, so that would have been like 32 gigabytes. I don't feel like that was necessary because we've essentially removed that need to pre-cache the data. You're not writing lots of unnecessary information into memory when it doesn't need to be there, so you need a lot less memory because of it. Uh, external, oh, okay, uh, external storage, HDD support for the PlayStation, which is just plugging in an external hard disk. It's going to be used, I think, just for installs of PlayStation 4 games on the machine because PlayStation 4 games were designed around the idea of a slow hard disk, so they don't need that super high-speed SSD to run. Microsoft has done a USB hard disk support for the same reasons, I believe, but a one terabyte expansion card, which would be a one terabyte, um, one terabyte memory card, essentially with an NVMe interface, which will be used to um, augment the one terabyte or half a terabyte um, storage space in the console itself. Now it's not mentioned anywhere here, and it really should be. But Sony has their own system for increasing the store internal storage. Now it's going to be rely on an NVMe solid state drive, which I believe needs to run off of a Gen 4 four lane NVMe drive, which is not a particularly common thing. Now I'm pretty sure I've seen them on like Newegg and stuff, but it's a technology that when Sony first unveiled the console was not seen. So it'll take a standard NVMe drive, but it's going to have to be one of a significant performance advantage that will essentially meet the um, the I.O. requirements of the console. Whereas Microsoft has memory cards being manufactured which will just work, but probably cost quite a bit the PlayStation is going to use the NVMe drives that you'll just be able to get from Newegg or Amazon or whatever. But it's going to be a little bit of a question on which ones you can use. Sony is supposedly going to test different ones that are hitting the market so you can buy third party and informing us through a list of which ones will work on the PS5. There's probably no doubt also going to be NVMe drives sitting in like a GameStop shelf or something like that which is packaged specifically for the PlayStation 5 removing that question from the uh, removing that complication a little bit but how much is that going to cost well they're going to be expensive 
they, at least at launch, they're going to end up, or the early days of these NVMe drives, they're going to be expensive because it's a new, newer technology, the newer high-speed device for the PlayStation, uh, for PCs and all that. So they're going to be expensive. As the technology advances, though, and that's no longer so fast, it's going to get quite a bit cheaper. So both expansions for the PS5 and the Xbox Series, whatever, are going to be expensive at launch. I feel like the Xbox drives are going to remain expensive throughout the lifetime of the console, though, because that's just how these kinds of things work. Physical media. Now, here we have the discrepancy again. First time we've run into a difference between the, fir the first and only time we're running into a difference between the PlayStation consoles. The PS5 has a 4K UHD Blu-ray, which is going to be used, of course, for by UHD movies, but it's primarily going to be used for the backwards compatibility with PlayStation 4 games and disc versions of PS5 games. If you buy the one without it, which is $100 cheaper, you lose access to all of that. But for some people, that's a worthy trade-off. Microsoft has the same exact situation, a 4K UHD Blu-ray and none on the cheaper console. Of course, lacking the Blu-ray drive makes it cheaper, so there we go. Not much to be said about that if you don't need the UHD Blu-ray for if you don't plan on buying any disc-based games in this generation, or you don't have any old discs that you want to plug into the machine and use, you're not interested in the Blu-ray uh, UHD movies, just get the one without it. Although it is interesting to note that if you want the... It is a, a something that should be noted that if you want the higher-performance Xbox console, you need to buy one with a UHD Blu-ray. Output resolution, they both say 4K. I don't know how many games we're ever actually going to end up seeing run at 4K on any of these consoles. Because even though it seems like, oh, we got all this more performance, it seems like 4K is going to be the standard. Reality is, though, that performance is not... Um, increase in resolution is not a linear increase of performance. And the reason for that is, I mean, it is in a lot of ways, but the reason why it isn't really is because as you increase the performance of the processors, developers tend to throw in more graphical effects, more complex shaders, realistic lighting, all that kind of thing, which drags down the performance output of the machine, which would lower frame rate or lower uh, resolution, all of that kind of stuff. So, okay, let's, let's make an example here, a real world example. The PlayStation 2, the PS2, released in like 2000, was technically capable of running at 1920 by 1080. How many games actually did that? Maybe two, and I think they're both Gran Turismo games. Or one was Gran Turismo and one was some motorcycle racing game. I think Polyphony still made it. But the machine was technically capable of it. So then advance a few years later, PlayStation 3. PlayStation 3's graphical performance was vastly greater than the PS2. So then you'd have to go right off the bat thinking, well, the PS2 could sort of do 1080. So the PS3 is definitely going to end up doing it. It ended up not being the case because of the complexity of the shader programs used in games. It ended up dragging that down. So a lot of PS3 games ran at 1280 by 720 higher resolution on average than you saw on the PS2, but definitely didn't lock itself down firmly on that 1920 by 1080 resolution. So then you jump to the PlayStation 4. PlayStation 4, significantly more powerful than the PlayStation 3. So then you have to think, like, finally, the PS2 could fucking do it. The PS4, vastly more powerful. It's definitely rock-solid 1920 by 1080, 60 frames per second. No, it didn't happen. Why? Because the increase in power saw an increase in the complexity of shaders and and um, things like render targets and all these different things, which increased the load on the GPU and it lowered the resolution. A lot of games did run at 1080p, more than the PS3 did and vastly more than the PS2 did, but it still wasn't a given that every single game ran at 1920 by 1080 So... 
it's not a linear increase. A, in doubling the performance of a GPU doesn't mean you're going to run double the resolution because it's all in the hands of the developers. Developer will look at 4K or they'll see a 4K or they'll see more realistic lighting and they'll say, you know what, the lighting is more important. Lower the resolution, increase the lighting. Or lower the resolution, increase texture resolution. Or lower the rendering resolution and increase draw distance or lower the rendering resolution and have 16 characters on the screen instead of only 10. It's in the hand of the developers and they're not going to choose 4K all the time. In fact, I'm willing to bet that a majority of them won't. Output resolution for Microsoft's console says 4K at 60 frames per second. Again, I don't think that's really going to happen. Target 120 frames per second, that most definitely won't happen for almost anything for the same reasons that I mentioned. You technically could get it, but you're not going to see many games that do. And the Series S, of course, lowers that target to a 1440p at 60 frames per second, or a target of 120. Now, 1440p, in terms of the linear progression of um, performance requirements for higher resolution, it is half. So, you only need half the compute power to do something at 1440 as you do at 4K, all other things being equal. Now, I don't think they will end up being equal, all other things, but given the fact that it runs at a little bit less than a third the power of the X, the S runs at a little bit of less than a third the power of the S, I don't think we're going to realistically be expecting something to run at half the resolution. There are going to be other compromises to make that happen, such as... Um, eliminating ray tracing or something like that. It doesn't say here, but these machines are technically capable of a semi-hardware based version of ray tracing, but I'm not going to get into that here. Target 120 frames per second, that's not happening. Get that out of your head. Connectivity. Ethernet, 10, 100, 1000, so uh, use like a use like a base 6 or a um, what do you call it? Um, Category 6 or Category 7 cable if you're going to go do that. Not that uh, most people's internet doesn't operate over 100 megabits per second. So that's not something to worry about so much. Uh, but, I mean, mine actually does. So using a Category 6 cable does give me an advantage there. It's getting a little bit in the weeds here, so I'm not going to talk about that. But it's identical across all the consoles. Now, Wi-Fi 802.11ax, which is the newest version of the Wi-Fi standard. I don't know what the performance characteristics of it all. I haven't really looked into it, but I do know AX is faster. It's also called Wi-Fi 6. In a lot of ways, it's an easier thing to say than 802.11ax or a just AX. But the two PlayStation consoles are, of course, identical in this regard. Microsoft is using 802.11ac dual band, which I guess means... I'm not sure what that means. That could either mean it is a dual band in the sense that it runs at 2.4 gigahertz as well as 5 gigahertz, which I would be surprised if Sony's console didn't do the same thing just for that whatever reason it wasn't mentioned. It also says dual band. It might also mean like a MIMO kind of thing where it is multiple input, multiple output, and it is um, putting the data connection to you multiple times over. Either way, I don't think you're going to see any sort of a performance deficit from Microsoft by using the slower version of Wi-Fi. I just don't think that network speeds are running fast enough, at least at the moment, to make that thing a kind of necessity. Sony could be pushing the higher Wi-Fi standard just because it's easier to get those parts nowadays, or they expect it to be in the future. And it also might be because Sony wants to push the PlayStation Now, which is their online game streaming service, to be um, a greater thing on the PlayStation 5 and higher performance Wi-Fi will be important for that if they can find some way of lowering the latency for that. What do we have here? This is just a lot of nonsense and comments. So we have launch games. Oh, a Sony also in their press conference announced a couple of things. Final Fantasy 16 is probably the biggest announcement that they made there. Um... A console exclusive on the PlayStation 5, 
it's going to be released next year, which is not that big of a surprise to me. Some people are like, oh, it's going to be coming out in 2024. No, they probably started developing on this right after 15 launched. And that was like four years ago. So they're like four years into the Stan Things development. It's probably launching next year. It looks pretty good. Uh, the trailer that they showed did say something about it being... Um, did say something about it being a uh, also running on the PC, and the trailer we saw was actually running on a PC, but it was sort of like spec to look like a PS5. The graphic style, in a way, looks a lot more realistic. It, it's more of a medieval kind of setting. Of course, it's got the fantasy and magical kind of things, a bit of a, a departure from the stuff that we had seen in 15 which had this sort of um, modern-ish kind of setting. It was kind of goofy. I like it, but it was goofy. Now we have this medieval-looking thing. Kind of funny character designs. But it, it kind of... I'm, like, I'm looking at this, and I feel like this is Kingdom Come Deliverance with, uh, with magic. <laughs> it looks amazing, though. I mean, unfortunately, when I had seen it, I was streaming it over, like, Pluto or something, so it looked like shit then. But watching it now, it, it looks... It looks uh, fantastic. I wonder how good this is going to end up being. Anyway, let's get out of that. They also uh, announced a God of War game, which I was never a big God of War fan. It's fine and all that. Maybe I'll give this one a try. But it's a big deal to some people. It's not to me. PlayStation 5 launch titles. Let's get into that. Demon Souls, a remake of the PS3 game. That's a big deal. A remake of a game shouldn't be a big deal, but it is. Spider-Man, Miles Morales, I don't give a rat's ass about Spider-Man, but the game looks good. Uh, it's also a cross-platform game between the PS4 and 5, so it might be limited on how good that's going to end up being. Devil May Cry 5 Special Edition, a last-gen game being, uh, I guess, special editioned for the new consoles. I don't know, it, okay, it is on the Xbox consoles as well. Playroom. Uh, it's going to use that camera, no doubt. Nah, I mean, Playroom's an interesting toy, but it's not something you want to spend any time with. Destruction All-Stars. I, uh, well, I don't really know much about what this is. Is it like... Uh, Yeah, whatever. Moving on. Sackboy, another, another little big planet game. I'm, you know, when I saw this, I wondered if this is a true little big planet game in the sense that it has the like um, world creation tools and the level creation tools that the little big planet games were known for, or if this is just a platforming game. I haven't seen anything to give me the indication that it does have the creation tools, but it is a little big planet game, although it doesn't go by that name. So you'd think it would, but, you know, it's not guaranteed. Fortnite, I don't care. Hogwarts Legacy, I've never been a fan of Harry Potter, but, uh, I don't know. It might be, if the game ends up actually reviewing well, then maybe I'll check it out. Final Fantasy 16, of course. Same trailer I looked at before. Resident Evil Village. This isn't a launch game, so I don't know why it's showing up here. It's a cross-platform game also. Resident Evil sort of went through this amazing revitalization a few times during its lifespan because it was sort of dying a slow death. Then Resident Evil uh, 4 came out and revitalized it. Changed what Resident Evil was at its core, but revitalized it. And it survived off of that for a while. But honestly, like, Resident Evil 5 was... I don't think it was any worse than 4, but the fact that it was really more of the same was kind of a downer. Resident Evil 6, I played for, like, 45 minutes. I said this sucked and turned it off. Resident Evil 7, on the other hand, changed the formula again and sort of went back to its horror roots. It was definitely a Resident Evil game with the puzzles and all that kind of stuff, but it changed it enough to make make it fresh again. Then, of course, the remake of 2 played more like 4 did, but much more horror-ish. 
Resident Evil 3 kind of dropped the ball on that. It was definitely a rush production or a budget production. Resident Evil 8. This is 8, right? <laughs> Resident Evil Village, I guess, is technically its name. Looks like it's going back to like a Resident Evil 7 style game, which 7 I don't think was good as the remake of 2, but it was still it was still quite good on its own merit. So I'm glad to see them continue on with that, because they already kind of dropped the ball on the remake style of 2 with 3. Deathloop looks interesting, but it's not a launch game. It got Buddy. delayed till next year. So I'll look further into that when uh, we get there. God of War Ragnarok, as I said before, I'm not a uh, huge God of War fan. But the last one was pretty good, so um, we'll see. I don't know what Lara Croft is doing down there. Series X games. Uh, we have Assassin's Creed Valhalla. That's a that's a cross generation and cross platform game. So I I mean honestly, the Assassin's Creed games. The last time I gave a crap about any of those was maybe uh, Rogue. After that, I sort of lost uh, lost interest in them. And then I played Odyssey, and Odyssey just it's not an Assassin's Creed game anymore. The RPG mechanics ruin it for me. Destiny 2, that's going to be a cross, uh, that's going to be a cross-platform game. And I don't really like Destiny either. Dirt 5, cross-platform, Gears Tactics. Now that is a, that is Take not a, a third-person shooter, is it? This is like an xcom -y kind of thing? Or is it like a, is this in real time? No, this feels like, this kind of looks XCOM-ish. Which I guess is fine. I don't know if it's what the Gears of War fans are wanting. But it could end up being good. Tetris Effect. Just a last-gen game being re-released. Watch Dogs Legion. I've never cared about Watch Dogs. I got the first one. It felt like it was trying to compete with... Whether it was a fair comparison or not, it was going to be compared to GTA V. I didn't like the main character, I didn't like any of the other characters, the gameplay was a little bit slower and boring, it wasn't the mayhem simulator that I was wanting it to be. Watch Dogs 2, never played, heard it was eh, no one cares. Watch Dogs Legion, another cross-platform, maybe even a cross-generation game, I don't know. But it's definitely not an exclusive to, um... Oh, you know, it's a, well, it's a timed exclusive for launch day, so maybe... Okay, so it's launching with the series, whatever. But it's also, I guess, on the 29th coming out for... Uh... Wait, no. It's launching, I guess, for current generation and probably PC, the 29th. Then the next-gen version is going to be exclusive for <laughs> the Xbox series, whatever. And then later it'll come to the PS5. This is stupid. That's complicated. Yakuza like a dragon. In head first. Timed exclusivity. I've never given these a try, so I don't know if they're any good. Launch window games. Of course, we have the Call of Duties. Cyberpunk 2077, a cross-gen game. Call of Duty might be cross-gen also. Oh, you know what? Cyberpunk 2077, uh, backwards compatibility. Won't get a next-gen upgrade until 2021. That's a little disappointing. I would have liked to have seen that come out for the next-gen consoles, like, natively. I'm still probably going to end up getting the PC version of it, because it's got DLSS support. But, you know. Anyway, that is a, my take on this next-gen console war. Ending thoughts? It's going to be a tight one. It's going to come down to the games, I feel like. Microsoft has made a big push in the last couple of years of buying up uh, third-party game studios, folding them into their first-party umbrella. Things like um, In Exile got bought out. Sony made some of the same effort buying Insomniac. So, both both are going to come out swinging. I feel like maybe Microsoft is missing an opportunity here by Halo, the next-generation Halo, missing, slipping its uh, launch date, so it's not going to be a launch game. That would have been a big deal. Halo at launch would have been huge, but it's not going to be there. So I feel like the 
I feel like they're both consoles are going to be a little anemic at launch, at least for exclusives. But Microsoft a little bit more so. And I don't know. They they both look like they know what they're doing this generation, and they're both nobody's making any big overt mistakes like Microsoft did with the Xbox One, or Sony did with the PlayStation Three, the generation before. Nobody's making any big mistakes. So, it'll be an interesting one to see. Which one will win the generate console of war? It's way too early to say that. Way too early. But anyway, that's my thoughts. I'm personally going to end up buying a PlayStation 5 once... I'm not going to pre-order or any of that shit. I'm not going through any of that. The first day I walk into a store and I see one sitting on a shelf and I can just pick it up and buy it, that's when I'm getting it. The Xbox, I'm not going to buy because all of the important games that come out for it also come out for PC and I am a PC gamer in heart. So, I will not be buying an Xbox Series X or S. If I do, it'll probably be for the sake of the kind of backwards compatibility with the 360. Because I would like eventually to buy a 360 again, get back into some of those old games. But 360 hardware is shit. It always was shit. Even the later gen versions of it was shit. And I'm afraid it'd break. (laughs) But the backwards compatibility, especially if they can make it a little bit better with the next generation, maybe someday I'll buy one. But it definitely won't be for the Xbox games because, well, they're all coming out for PC as well. And I don't know if you've seen that next-gen NVIDIA hardware that was announced a couple of weeks ago. But it is freaking impressive as shit. And, well, the future is going to be bright, let's just say that. But anyway, this is an hour, an hour long. Holy shit, I've been going on for that long. i got to take a piss. Anyway... <laughs> If you managed to watch all this, thanks. I don't know why you did, because I definitely wouldn't have. You're, You're a better person than I.